Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. We've just admitted all of you that are in the waiting room. We really appreciate your registering and participating for today's program. Uh, we'll give folks another few minutes uh, to log on, uh, and then we'll have some housekeeping reminders, uh, and then we'll get started with our program. Will these slides be shared with us later? Yes. So uh, I'll just go over those housekeeping notes right now. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. That's also how we're going to handle all of our questions. Uh, we have a large audience today, so please keep that in mind. If by chance you have some background noise uh, at your location, just take a moment and mute. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll mute you if that uh, arises. Uh, again, we'll be using chat. The session both today and tomorrow will be recorded and we'll be sending that link to everyone who's registered, whether you're able to join us in live and in person, uh, or, and we'll also post the link uh, on the ABRF website. Just a couple of uh, quick housekeeping updates and ABRF reminders. Uh, I'm sure everyone is aware the ABRF annual meeting is coming up in May in Boston. Uh, early registration has been extended through the end of February. So please scan the QR code that's here on the slide or go to the website to register today or through the end of the month for the best opportunity. Our next event will be next week. It's our virtual peer mentoring discussions. These are monthly conversations with ABRF members to learn a little bit more about the aspects of working in a core. Uh, you see some of the prior discussion topics that have been addressed. These are, these are usually discussed on a fairly consistent basis. So if you or some of your colleagues would like some help from your peers or to learn more about some of these opportunities. It's a self-created agenda. So the audience that's there decides what topics will be addressed. We use breakout rooms to really provide that opportunity to learn and engage with your colleagues. So that's next week at two Eastern on Tuesday. Our next monthly town hall will be next week, uh, February 22nd on instilling a culture of collaboration and mindfulness around core instrumentation. We have a terrific number of panel of speakers, including our president-elect Marie Adams, and they'll be talking about their experiences working with users, of course, to help one another understand the each, each group's perspectives and how to work more effectively together in a, in a spirit of collaboration. The March Town Hall will address the development of affinity groups within ABRF, those opportunities for safe spaces within our organization for, organ for folks who maybe feel underrepresented or not always partic actively participating in ABRF. We'll discuss how we're going to establish those programs and or those groups rather, and that'll be a prelude to a conversation we'll be having at the ABRF annual meeting around establishing and supporting affinity groups within ABRF. Debbie Hollingshead from the University of Pittsburgh and the ABRF DI Council will be leading that program on Wednesday, March 15th. And a reminder that the ABRF chapter meeting schedule is being finalized. You see most of the dates uh, for the regional chapter meetings throughout the country coming up this year. Uh, the, the meeting on the West Coast is also being settled in terms of the dates, and they think they're focusing on Portland, Oregon. Uh, more details about these events are available on the chapter websites through the ABRF website as well. We have a very quick one question survey that we'd appreciate your input on, which is to help identify what other member society, what other societies you're a member of, uh, because we have a task force that's actively looking at collaboration opportunities between ABRF and peer related organizations. So uh, this data will help us understand which societies there's the greatest intersection between ABRF members, which provides us an opportunity to have productive conversations around potential collaboration. So again, you can follow the link, you can scan the QR code. It's a one question survey. It'll take just a minute uh, to provide that feedback and we really appreciate it. Let's see. So here's today's program. Uh, our speakers, thanks, thanks to all three of them. We really appreciate their contributions. Keep in mind that we'll, we'll have this program at the same time tomorrow, a different program, but continuing this program at the same time tomorrow. So with that, I will stop the housekeeping announcements.
and turn it over to Joe Dragomon, who will kick us off. Go ahead, Joe. Great. Thank you, Ken. All right, everybody, just one second while I share my screen. Let's make sure I share the correct screen. And as always, finding the correct screen is by far the hardest one. There we are. Great. Uh, can everybody see that and in presentation mode? Fantastic. All right. Everyone can see the same thing? Fantastic. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, our first uh, day of a two-day workshop, um, all focusing on the S10 uh, program. Of course, click on it. Do you think after a couple of years I'd figure this out? But as always, there's hiccups at the beginning. So uh, today is part one where we're going to go over developing the foundation for your S10s and basically just walk you through our experiences, uh, what we found worked, uh, what didn't work, uh, go over you know a suggested timeline, who to contact, things of this nature. So it's sort of covering a broad swath of stuff. But today's work is mainly our discussion <laughs> session is mainly on the preparation for your S10. Uh, there are three of us to help you out with a varying uh, range of experiences. Uh, my name is Joe Dragovan. I'm the director of the BioFrontiers Advanced Life Microscopy Corps here at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I have not ever been successful running an S10, which makes me perfect for leading uh, this endeavor uh, here. However, I'm getting better. Uh, I, I initially scored a 50 years ago, and I'm down to a 30, so I'm Fingers crossed, I, I'm, I'm getting there. But I've, I've learned a lot doing this process, uh, and so that's why I'm here today. We have two others, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Sheena Mache. I'm at NYU um, Grossman School of Medicine, which is part of NYU Langone. Um, I have participated in 10 successful uh, S10 or AGI grants for the institution. Um, we take more of a, a team effort in terms of support you know, submitting our, our S10s. So um, happy that you all came and hopefully we will share some good information with you. So, hi, I'm Sue Weintraub, a professor of biochemistry, University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, director of the mass spectrometry core facility. Um, I have had nine successful S10s over the time, and I did not come up with the moniker that uh, Joe put after my S10 list. But I'm delighted to be able to tell you about this program because without it, I really would never have been able to be successful in this position. Joe. Great. Thank you. All right. So uh, today's workshop uh, sort of a couple of phases to it or the workshop that we're, we're talking about. Um, we have two days. Like I said, today is day one. We are focusing on developing the foundation. And tomorrow, we're focusing more on the, the writing of the S10 because it's sort of really a, a biphasic uh, application process. Questions are welcome at any time. Please stick them in the, the chat. We're going to try to get to them as they come through as well as we can. But please remember, there is a, a, a relatively long Q&A session at the end of all the slides. So you can reserve your questions until then. Um, uh, and then if you want to hear more, uh, just to plug this, uh, there is going to be a dedicated uh, S10 discussion session at the ABREF conference in Boston in 2023. The details you can see there, uh, specifically May 8th, so you don't want to miss it. And you get representatives from the NIH, the NSF, and the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. Um, so this will be very uh a good opportunity to continue this discussion there. And I will say as well, at the 2024 meeting, we'll be continuing the discussion even further. Click on various things. All right, so now it's time for the polls uh, because we wanna make sure you're interactive uh, for a little bit. The first question, and Ken, I believe is going to launch the poll, is here, all right. Question one is, have you submitted an S10 proposal in the past five years? And everyone's answering away, which is fantastic. Question two, just so I can read it out loud, is have you received S10 funding in the past five years? And the third question is, are you planning to submit an S10 proposal? The, the idea of these questions was just to sort of get some perspectives on where everybody uh, lands. And you know, we'll show the results here in just another uh, 20 seconds, if that's OK, Ken, so at the one minute mark. Uh, and we'll share the results with everybody and it'd be cool so you can see where you fit into the audience. 
All right, just a few more seconds. Great job, everybody answering through. This is very exciting. I love interactive polls. All right, cool. So uh, here we are. Ken is sharing the results as of right now. We can all see the results. Is that correct? I'll take that as a yes or no. Can we see those? Um, Should be able to, yes? Yes, yes. All right, great. Thank you, sorry. I can only see what's on my screen. Uh, and here we are. All right, so as you can see, uh, a, a large portion of us uh, have um, not submitted in the past five years, which means there's uh, either a bunch of new people, which is great, or people who haven't tried in a long time, uh, which is not great. I think we should all be trying as often as we can. But there's also definitely a number of people who have been going for, through this. So that means like the, the, the audience, if you will, uh, covers both ends. And then we have a range of successes. You know, uh, some people have been successful and, and some have not. Uh, and we'll lean on everybody to uh, hopefully make us all more successful. And those of you who have been successful, please don't hesitate to chime in if there's something that worked for you that we don't cover. Um, and then I find this the most exciting. Most of us are going to try uh, either this year or next year, which is great. Um, like I said, I really feel like we should all be trying as, as often as possible. It's, it's the best way to learn. And that's been uh, one of my main takeaways is like, you don't know what it is until you start doing it. And then hopefully you get feedback and go from there. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we are going to stop sharing. Fantastic. And we'll go on to uh, the next slide, uh, which is a repeat. Apologize. Oh, it's not a repeat. I misread it. So part one is the agenda for today. So uh, you're going to hear some fun things. We're going to talk about uh, the history of the S10 because I think history is important. It's nice to know where it came from. I believe we're entering soon year or we just did year 40 of the S10 program. So uh, there's been a big evolution in it. And one of us has a lot of history with it. And you're going to hear some cool stories. Um, we're also going to talk about what is an S10. So if those of you who have never done this before, you'll actually learn the purpose of the program. Uh, and then we'll get into the meat of it. Time is of the essence. It's a long process to get the S10 done. Uh, some people can panic and get it all done in a couple of months, but most of us require much longer than that. And we're going to talk about this, when to prepare, uh, and when should you start? Um, you should start sooner rather than later is, is, is basically always the answer. Uh, and then why prepare? Uh, preparation is everything that's going to make your life a lot easier. And I'd also say with this experience at the same time, the more you do this, the better, more you can anticipate all the different things you're going to need to know. And then we'll end with the Q&A session. So this first portion will take about, the goal is about 45 minutes or so, uh, but we left some slop in here so we can go longer if needs be. And then we'll get to the Q&A session, which I always find are, are the most informative and as we were designing the, the two days, we wanted to give lots of time for the Q&A for everybody, uh, mainly because we learn uh, a lot from each other at that moment in time. And next is we're going to start with the history, which is very exciting. Sue? Okay. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, <clears throat> well, what you see here is a map uh, that shows by state funding uh, from the S-10 program. And very interesting to see, this is for the period from fiscal year uh, 2012 to 21. There's four states where there were 50 or more instruments funded. You can see New York, Pennsylvania, California, and yay, Texas. Um, uh, varying amounts lower and a few states, unfortunately, with none in this whole period. Um, in fiscal in that time, there were a total of 1,179 instruments funded. Now, the concept for a shared transportation grant program was started in the late 1970s by Dr. Marvin Kastman, who was a health science administrator and section chief at National Institutes of General Medical Sciences, that's NIGMS. And they recognized the need for shared instrumentation and came out with a program to support instruments in the range of $40,000 to $150,000, which was quite a bit back in the late 70s. And while the concept was great, the requirements for the user group was really quite stringent because it had to be predominantly users who were funded through the NMI NIGMS program. They started it in 79, 
And within a couple of cycles, unfortunately, they ran out of eligible uh, applicants because there just weren't enough people with NIGMS funding. Around the same time, Dr. Marjorie Tingle, who was a program officer in the Biomedical Research Support Branch in the Division of Research Resources, had also recognized the need for shared instrumentation. And she came up with a much more flexible plan, and uh, it was designed to be able to support a wider range of NIH-funded researchers. And this was in the early 1980s. And so the BRS, Biomedical Research Support Shared Instrumentation Grant, uh, was first announced in June 1980 in the NIH Guide for Grants and Contracts. Of course, in those days, everything was printed and mailed out. Um, and this was a, called a funding opportunity announcement. You'll hear more of that term, a FOA. Um, and it had a whopping budget of $3.7 million. Uh, there were going to be supporting instruments in the range of 75,000 to 250,000. Again, quite a bit. And it was uh, June 1981 where this was announced, and there were very quickly over 200 applicants submitted, but with a budget of only 3.5 million, only 23 of the applications could be funded, which was an 11% uh, success rate. And at that time, that was relatively low compared to the rest uh, of the NIH funding. Uh, now, I will say that the success of the program from the beginning quickly added a uh, budget so that by 1985, the budget was $30 million and an astounding 75% success rate, because at that time, there was really encouraging everybody possible to apply. Now, current funding success rate is about 30 to 33%, which is still a very clearly worth your effort to try. Well, back in that time, I was a young research assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology. I had been hired to start a mass spectrometry core in 1979, and I was desperately in need of current instrumentation with new capabilities. And so I decided to submit a proposal. And on the next slide, you could see a picture of uh, that I took of this proposal that I still happen to have. And if you can read the top, which probably not, is in my hand pencil writing says original typing and original letters. Because of course, back in the early 1980s, we didn't have personal computers. There were, were processing programs on mainframes, not at all suitable. And so this had to be hand typed. Uh, and letters were mailed, sent to you, and uh, support letters, and you put them in. Then you sent this giant pack to NIH, and then the reviewers got this giant box back. Whenever it showed up, you just knew your work was just starting of all of the copies of your assigned proposals. And then you had to take them with you to the review meeting, and you'd carry them on the plane. So it was quite a chore. And on the next slide, you can see what I was requesting. And this was a Finnegan Mat 212. And Finnegan Mat uh, Company eventually is the one that's now known as Thermo. And this was an amazing instrument made in Germany. It had a gas chromatography interface, fast atom bombardment, a giant moving belt LC interface that's not shown. Um, and it had a computer, which is also very unusual for them. It's not shown, and it also wasn't very small. And astoundingly, I was very fortunate and got funded in that first year of the program. Uh, you can see it's a fairly complex instrument, and it had a very heavy magnet that had to be placed around the flight tube. And here I am just petrified and seeing what happened. We had to rent an engine hoist to put it on, and I was sure that the flight tube was going to be destroyed. Well, that was back in 1982, and uh, it was really exciting because this started my career in mass spectrometry. All right, so on the next slide, um, why prepare? And Joe has already alluded to this. 
in the beginning, we're going to just be telling you not as many details in the beginning because you really need to think this whole process through. There's many moving parts to an S-10 proposal, far more than an individual investigator initiated grant like uh, such as an R01 or even a program project. And you don't want to get right near the deadline and find that you're missing a key element, some documentation, a letter. And so you've got to think through the whole process and even decide, are you ready? Is this the year for you uh, to submit this proposal? So preparation is key and then you'll know what to write and then you can get started. So on the next slide, please. What is an S-10? Uh, it is obviously shared instrumentation. That's what we're talking about. And there's a couple key elements here. Um, first off, shared use. This is not having an investigator with an instrument in their lab and they let a few friends use it on occasion. And we'll be discussing this at several more times during today and tomorrow. But there needs to be clear documentation of how it's going to be used and how it's going to be accessed. So these are things you've got to work out before you get started. Is this even feasible in your situation? Now, I have saw many of you as you signed in and you're already in course, so that is a leg up on the whole process. Okay, another critically important point, commercially available instrument. What this means is the instrument has to be available for purchase by anyone. It has to have a model number, and not shown here, it actually has to have a warranty. This is something NIH is clear that if it is a not a test instrument or something exploratory, it will have some sort of a warranty. Usually it's a year. So these are key elements and we will be going over uh, several of those as we go along. Now, what isn't covered? All right, you can't ask for um, multiple instruments bundled together, unless they are, for example, in mass spectrometry, you often request a HPLC. That's fine, but you can't ask for two different types of instruments. Uh, it can't be for instruction only. You can't be for clinical use, not for administrative use. All right, software it can be a little tricky. Uh, because software by itself cannot be requested. But if it's essential for use of your requested instrument, it's fine. Mass spectrometry, we need to use software for data processing, database searching, that can be included. Uh, can't be multiple standalone workstations, nothing general purpose, no, nothing disposable, office furniture, supplies, and no renovation. So those are clearly outlined in all of the FOA and documentation, but you need to be sure ahead of time that what you're asking for is realistic. And the due date for this year is June 1st. And next year, it's June 3rd. Uh, usually, the announcements are out uh, for three consecutive years, and so we'll be awaiting uh, the subsequent years after that. Next slide, please. There's three main categories of S-10 proposals. The first is called BIG. It's Basic Instrumentation Grant. It's a range of 50,000 to 250K. You can see there's different ranges, which is the predominant difference between the, sec the uh, categories. But the BIG ones are very specific because it's for institutions that have not received S-10 instrumentation funding of over 250,000 or greater in any of the preceding three federal fiscal years. And also for the big program, an institution can only submit one application. For the other programs, as many as the institution wants can be submitted. Uh, obviously, they can't be for the exact same instrument from uh, different people unless it's clearly documented how they're different. Uh, the bulk of instruments will fit into the S-10 program, 50,000 to 600,000, and then the high-end program, 600 to 2 million. Now, the instrument can cost way over the limit of your program, but then you have to clearly explain where that money is going to be obtained. 
we can think of three main justification types for S10 applications. Is, and this kind of in the order of how easy it is to justify. The first one is the easiest. Replacing an aging instrument that has been heavily used, essential to many NIH-funded investigators, um, but it's either beyond its service support life, it could now be broken, it obviously has to have been working well for a long time. But this is the easiest to document because you've already got the users who are relying on this instrument. Now next, which is a little harder, is acquiring additional instruments to take care of capacity. This is obviously an important need and many of you may feel that that's necessary, but you've got to clearly then explain how it, what the capacity is, how it's overloaded, and how the investigator's research is being impeded by having to wait a month, two months, three months for access. Now, the next one that's somewhat harder is acquiring an instrument that has new functionality or capabilities. You clearly can't be asking for, I want the latest and greatest just because everybody's getting one. So this has to be really tied to the needs of your user group. And we'll be repeating a number of these things several times because at this stage, you should just be thinking about it. Do you have a request that fits in one of these categories that can be justified? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, we will be covering these sections, some today and again more tomorrow. But right now, just to think about what you're going to need to know and make sure that you have available. You're going to have to justify the need of what it is, what the instrument and why. The word that you have to keep in mind throughout is what is the impact of this instrument on your NIH funded and other investigators. Not everyone has to have NIH funding, but there are clear percentages that you have to meet. And then another that's often a very difficult to show, uh, you have to document it well, is are there other instruments or technologies in your area or your institution that could meet your needs? So you're going to need to be able to explain why anything else that's available is, is not usable for your user group. You'll need to describe this core or facility. It does not have to go into a formal core, but I can assure you it's far easier if it is an established core with a mechanism for shared use already set up, but it, it is not a requirement. And there needs to be qualifications and experience of the facility director and the staff. Um, again, if it's an operating core using somewhat similar equipment, this is much easier to document. If it's an institution who wants to add a completely new technology and doesn't have that expert on staff and is planning to hire someone, I can assure you that is a really steep hill to climb and very difficult to be convincing. You're going to need to summarize your major or minor users' research projects. These people, your users, are going to have to be cooperative and send you the necessary documentation and information about their projects. Again, in an experience, uh, existing core, it's a little easier if they're already using your core, but there's a lot of information that you need to present in a clear and concise way. And again, how it will impact and advance their research. And at this point, we're not talking about administration of how the users access the instrument, but it will need to be made clear, will it be self-use by students and staff or will the core uh, and people uh, be running the analyses. And then there's several summary tables that you'll need to provide. Uh, accessible user time uh, we'll get into again, but this is a measure of the percent use of uh, by each individual investigator. And there's no hard and fast rule of how you set up accessible time because different institutions have different uh, possibilities. For example, in some places you can't be in there except during normal business hours. Other instruments can run 24 seven. So this is something very specific for your type of instrument and your facility. And then 
accessories. This is can be very important uh, as far as being convincing in your grant because you don't want to just order the instrument with everything possible. You need to be sure the accessories are tied again to the needs of the users and how it will advance their research. Next slide. Ah, Sheena, your turn. Okay. So um, the section on administration for organization management plan is really important because the investigator applying for the S10 must convince the study panel that the instrument will be well utilized and cared for during its useful service life. So having a sound financial plan and solid technical expertise can help applicants build a strong management plan. So you need to have a thorough plan for training and recruiting new users as well. And although it's not required, presenting a strong data management plan is very important because the reviewers will then see that the applicants have thought ahead and planned well for maximizing the usage of the requested instrumentation. For institutional commitment, this is also essential. Applicants must show that their institution is willing to support the instrument that they wish to purchase using a combination of several methods. So you need to focus on institutional support and you need to let to convey that the uh, that the institution is committed to keeping up the instrument well beyond the award period. The applicants must show their institution is willing to dedicate and renovate dedicated space and infrastructure for the equipment. So they have to be able to accommodate this. And also to emphasize that training and outreach because again, NIH wants to know that everything that goes along with having this instrument in your core, in your institution, is going, it's going to be well used. They hate to see that instruments are not being used. For the overall benefit, this should really convey strongly the impact of this instrument that it will have overall on the institution. That is, you know, the likelihood or probability that this instrument will exert a powerful influence on the institution's long range research goals. And then to specifically move that those goals forward for the research of that NIH funded major user group, okay? Because that's, that's really important. Um, going along with that then, in terms of letters of support and commitment, I can't emphasize enough how important these letters are. You need to have letters from institutional officials and an institutional plan conveying a backup in terms of the proposed financial plan that you've done up in the administration section. You also need a letter to talk about the inventory of instruments that in at the institution which are unavailable. So similar instrumentation and why they're not available. These are sometimes called letters of non-support. Um, so why can't you use that instrument? And often, you know, I tell people to check the NIH reporter to find NIH funded S10 instruments near you to say, why aren't those available to you as well? And then if you're doing anything with human, animal or infectious materials, a letter from the biosafety official at your institution um, stating that the proposed containment plan has been reviewed and adheres to documented biosafety regulations. Next slide, please, Joe. So here we put together a timeline and we just thought that it was quite illustrative of you know, what, what's really involved, okay? I have to emphasize this is one of the very few funding opportunities available to course. So you want to take the time to fully present your narrative and the justification for the instrument or platform that you are proposing and how important that instrument is in advancing the research goals of your major users, minor users in the research community. So applying for an S10 shared instrumentation grant can be very challenging. 
and it is, you know, people underestimate it. So this is why we decided to put out this very nice timeline, which conveys, you know, here we are in February and where are we projecting? Well, we're actually projecting for submitting a grant for 2024, right? So this to us is the ideal timeline, especially for those who have not done S10s before because we can't emphasize the importance of preparation. Um, Sue talked about it initially, Joe has talked about it. Um, and so I'm just, I'm not gonna belabor this, but I'm just saying that this is, this is truly um, a lot of thought went into this timeline and a lot of thought went into each one of the stages in terms of where you should be in terms of your, uh, in terms of your preparation. So, you know, is a new instrument really needed? Do similar technologies exist? Um, how do you then look in terms of planning that application, you know, in terms of reviewing the FOA? And don't just review it once, you know, you've got to be looking at this time and time again. And then the big part of it is the instrument demos and collecting those key metrics. You know, how getting that pilot data um, showing that this is really going to address the needs of the major users, the needs of the research, you know, community. Um, you know, this, this is really important. And whether you have in-house demos, whether you're preparing samples to send out, um, these are all really critical. And then, of course, the various drafts, assembling your major user committee, collecting those biosketches, rewriting research aims, it's time consuming. So um, with that, with the next slide, Joe, I'll just go into, um, you know, how this talk is broken up. So there it is. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, smooth transition. And that's what we're going for here. So uh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, just before I go on, go on to the next slide, where we're going to actually start getting into the meat of today's session, um, we, we decided to break it up in this way, like sort of like the, the planning portion. And for a lot of us, that can take a lot of time, right? But in order to plan correctly, you also have to know the end of where you're, you need to get to, right? And so it's very, it's sort of like this, you know, sort of cyclical approach to get to the same thing um you know and also like you know as we sort of identify these out like none of this is truly quantized in anything like it's like these months you have to do this and so on and so forth it's also just sort of blends the whole time you're always reevaluating what it is you need but what you don't want to get is to the near the very end and realize like oh man i really wish i had this data set how do i get that data set now all of a sudden right I do think uh, the most important is uh, the very end where you have your drinks. Uh, most likely, this drink slope would increase over time, <laughs> so you'll probably end up having quite a few drinks along this process. Uh, but this having this sort of timeline, at least in your head, it, is very, very informative. So I'm going to take over now, and the, the reason why I'm going to be leading this part is because I just you know, had just submitted last year and I got my reviewer comments back. So a lot of this is still fresh in my mind. And it's also just to relate to you my, my experiences um, going through this. So one of the first things you need to ask yourself besides what is the instrument that you want and is it uh, achievable is who can be the PI on, on the application, right? And this, one of the great things for the NIH is you don't have to be a, a full professor or anything of that nature. You can actually just, um, uh, just be any staff member at the university who is allowed to pursue this. You just need to check within your own institution, are you allowed to be a PI on a grant application? I'm assuming most of us, uh, if the NIH says it's okay, it's okay with them, but it is worth double checking just in case you're not allowed to be the PI. Um, it is optimal though that the PI knows the technology and will be providing the direct oversight of the instrument. So it's basically like, the PI is really taking ownership. It's not saying I'm going to be the PI, but you know, Mr. or Mrs. Smith over here is actually going to do all the work and do everything for it. So it's really best if the PI is actually the one who, who is overseeing uh, everything. Then per the S10 program, the PI doesn't need to be a major or minor user. 
doesn't have to be a tenure track faculty, which is great because that I'm not a tenure track faculty member. And nor do you have to have be a recipient of NIH or other funding, uh, which is also good for me. Uh, so I check uh, all three of those boxes. And I think a lot of us on this call probably do in one facet uh, or another. And Jeff just brought up this point. A lot of institutions are now starting to doing this, this little initial internal application. Uh, so you may want to also come uh, consult with your Office of Contracts and Grants or whatever it is that interfaces with a uh, federal agency just to make sure they're aware of what it is you're trying to do. But let me add at this point, uh, Joe, yep. that you can definitely ask for two of the same instrument types if the user groups and the needs are very different. So it, it obviously has to be clearly explained, but it doesn't preclude you uh, but your institution may not let you. But uh, as far as NIH is concerned, it's not a problem. Different PIs, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you may run into this at uh, medical centers, you know, that are very heavily NIH funded institutions like myself. Uh, we're primarily NSF funded, so the, the NIH pool of investigators is smaller. And uh, you just want to make sure there's separate pools of people uh, as well as you can. We are. So, you know, then as you're going through the process, you know, especially at the beginning. Uh, so what, what we did here is, you know, I'm talking about different things, but then you can see like in the parentheses, like the section that I'm sort of referring to. This is why we went through the sections at the beginning, just to start giving you context of where you're going to answer these questions. And, you know, the big thing to ask yourself is which instrument you're going to pursue and why. So for myself uh, in the, the 2022 application, uh, I submitted for a laser scanning confocal. Uh, ours is end of life, um, really heavily used, you know, lots of different things for why I think we should have another one. But I had to also say, like, well, why can't I use a spinning disc confocal? It's a similar enough technology. So I really, in the process, have to differentiate what I can do with a laser scanning confocal that I can't do with a spinning disc, you know, basically how the needs will be met or unmet on the various technologies. So knowing why and then knowing or knowing the instrument and then knowing all the different facets around that instrument and the different uh, comparable technologies is very important for you so what about the instrument is is unique you know not only just with cap capability but how is it going to advance and impact the research of the user group and you'll notice here that user group is capital letters because within the s10 proposal if you've never looked at one they're often referring to major and minor users. These are specific groupings of investigators. So we try to highlight that here. And in the, you know, soon you have to be thinking about that. Like, okay, what is their research? And is their research absolutely in need of the instrument you're trying to pursue? Uh, smaller institutions might, might, like myself, a lot of people will use a laser scanning confocal because that's what we have, not because they actually need it, but just because what we have. Right, and that can create problems down the road. So you really have to prove you need this technology and everything that comes with it. And then finally, where is it going to go? If you're a core, like myself, it's sort of easier, like it's gonna go in the core, or at least fall under the auspices of, of the core and have to think about how are the user, users get access to it. If it's gonna go into a lab, this can become much more challenging because you need to make sure that all the users that are gonna be mentioned in your application will be able to access it. So. Finding common space, secure common space, is one of the easiest ways of going about this. But you know, it's all about how hard do you want to make your justification uh, for these different things. So, um, you know, <clears throat> having a thought as to where is physically going to be placed. Uh, I like in, in my applications actually showing a drawing of where it's going to be placed, and uh, if needs be, little like um family circus dash lines about how people will get to the instrument uh, can't hurt, right? You just make it as straightforward as possible. This is one of the longest parts at the early stages is finding out what's accessible around you. And, and it's not just in other cores. Uh, if there are multiple cores on your campus, multiple, for example, I'm, I'm a light microscopy core. Um, if there are multiple microscopy cores, I have to take an inventory of what they have and what I need and make sure that, and justify why my users can't go to that facility there. But on top of just at my institution uh, or at your institution, you have to look at nearby institutions and say why your users can't go over there to get their needs met, right? So the NIH is really looking for things that are going to be centrally located, unique, 
to the region and actually be impactful for the whole region, right? If there are available resources very close nearby, they'll most likely just say, go use that one. You, we don't have to uh, give you money to buy your own. So um, can you access these things? And this, if you're dealing with biological samples, as, as Sheena mentioned earlier, it's great to have letters from your health and safety officers saying you're not allowed to transport samples outside the building or off your campus for you know, various health and safety reasons. Uh, all that, all these types of statements uh, strengthen your justification as to why you yourself need the instrument and your user group needs the instrument. And here, you really cannot make assumptions that the reviewers will know or understand your situation incredibly well. You have to be painfully obvious and clear to them. Um, and it, you know, when you get your reviewer comments, you learn a lot. You're like, well, everybody knows that a spinning disk, you can't adjust the pinhole. And you're like, nope, <laughs> you better specify that within your application. So more clarity, uh, the better here. And, and it really involves you thinking it out loud. One of the things that uh, I did in my most recent application, um, I know my wife didn't enjoy this thoroughly, but I would walk her through my thought process. And if it, uh, she's brilliant, she's way smarter than I am, but as long as it made sense to her as a non-microscopist herself, I, I felt pretty confident about my logic uh, going forward. And uh, I think the reviewers liked most of it as well. Uh, so where will the new instrument be located? Uh, I already touched on this. Uh, if it's an existing core, that's life is easiest at that point. And if it's not going to be in a core, why not go into a core? If the core doesn't exist, that's sort of a, a, a nice out. But if the core does exist, then why can't it go into the core, right? And you'll probably need a letter from the core facility manager or director saying why it can't go into the core, right? They, they need to be aware of what's going on. And I think that would greatly strengthen your application. Think about who's gonna oversee everything. Who's going to be managing the day-to-day -day operation, the, the trainings, the maintenance, things of that nature? Uh, if it's an instrument uh, that requires a staff member to run the samples, who's going to do that, right? You, and then how is it going to be accessed? Key card, you know, things of that nature, a calendar system. So if you have iLabs or Stratacore, your life is easier or, you know, any of the other multitude of calendar systems that are out there. You definitely don't want to say pen and paper. I would have to imagine that's a big no-no as much as possible. Um, and so, yeah, so use Google Calendar if you, if you need to, but you need some sort of administration uh, when you're thinking about all these different things. All right, so for the uh, preparation, one of the things that, uh, I messed up the very first time. So this is like five years ago, the first time I tried and I got a horrific score, <laughs> like it was very depressing, um, is really read through the whole uh, funding opportunity announcement, the FOA, before you really start. Like, and it's a very exciting read, uh, it'll really keep you up at night, um, but definitely read through it. There's a lot of details there. And so one of the things I learned in the second time around, and this is from my, my colleague uh, just on the other side of the wall for me, um, what she did, uh, she actually created a to-do list and a checklist for every single section as she was reading it. And she mentioned that to me and I was like, man, that's a brilliant idea. So I did my own. And that was incredibly insightful, uh, incredibly helpful to know what goes into every single section. It helped me fill the gaps and I would identify gaps uh, within my own initial thought process. And it really helps you out in your whole planning process. Like how long is this going to take? Like, and am I gonna be able to check all these different boxes that are necessary? This is all part of the preparation. So really slow down and write it out for yourself because every instrument and every core is gonna have a slightly different checklist. So we didn't provide a checklist as part of this, mainly because of that. I don't think you could create a, a universal checklist for, for any of this stuff. You want to become familiar with the organization of the actual FOA, right? Because it's, you know, for those of us who are not very experienced writing grant applications to the NIH or anything of this scale, the organization is a bit different. And there's a bunch of sections in there uh, that you need to complete. Every section has different requirements. And so you want to know about that early. Like I said, you want to avoid the situation where, you know, it's May 28th, and you need to submit it to your internal office before it can go to the NIH, and you're like, you're missing data sets that like you definitely don't want or want that, or you're missing letters of support or whatever the case may be. You don't want to be panicking. On top of that, 
there are page limits. Now, some people like myself are not very good at writing. Uh, I'm a very wordy person uh, and page limits. I'm like, ah, nine pages, that'll take me forever. And then I get halfway through what I wanted to say and I'm at nine pages and you're in a lot of trouble. So really pay attention to those page limits. Conciseness is key. Conciseness and, and clarity um, is uh, super impactful. If you can have someone read through your section who's not science-based, uh, one of the advantages there is they're just looking for flow. Are they lost by the time they get to the end or not? We're very, very fortunate at our university. Uh, we've hired a couple of people, um, one of whom is on this call, who do exactly that for us. And that was so impactfully helpful uh, in such a positive way. Like I, I know my score that I got recently is largely due to, to Jim. Hi, Jim. I know you're on the call. Um, because of that. So getting other people to look at it, you know, because one of the things I, I know many of us struggle with is we know what we know incredibly well, and it can be hard to imagine what other people don't know, right? And like reading in between the lines and things of that nature. You got to understand, and I think we address this later, your reviewers may not be an actual expert on your technology, right? So you want to make sure that, you know, a scientific lay person, for lack of a better phrase, will understand what you're trying to say and actually uh, read things exactly as you're, you're, you're intending. Joe, I'd like to add one thing here. Please. Uh, just because there is a page limit of say four pages for major or minor, major users each, you don't need to do four pages. You only use the amount of space that is necessary to clearly explain your case because the reviewers are going to have a very large number assigned to them and it needs to be as clear as possible. So just because you have that option, don't necessarily use it unless you must. Absolutely, thank you very much, Sue. And as, as we've been putting this together, uh, it's been interesting to see our, our contrasting styles to get this stuff done. Um, and I have learned a lot uh through preparing this so hopefully my next one won't be to the very last little character space on the last little page it might be more pleasant for <laughs> future reviewers to actually read through um so speaking of the preparation you know you need to talk to your potential major and minor users you're going to need these faculty and investigators to be supportive of what you need because you know they have to help you meet the criteria like they you need a certain number of NIH funded investigators. I think the minimum is three uh, NIH funded investigators, but you can have more, right? Um, you can have non NIH funded investigators and they can be minor users, but you do need the majority to be NIH funded. And I believe there's a preference for R01 funded investigators. Is that correct? No, that, that's not the case anymore. There used to be some very specific, but. And, and this is something you'll read in the FOA and you'll read it and reread it because it's not clear. There must be three major users who are NIH funded. Uh, NIH use, the major users have to use 35%, but NIH users as a whole have to be 75%. And when you look at it, it seems like it's uh, not compatible. But if you have the option and you're at a medical center, and you can pick all, it, it can be funding, they don't have to have all NIH funding, but if an investigator, at least one, has NIH funding, it just makes it easier because then they all do. But mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, um, you be careful about the percentages. And the percent that we're talking about speaks back to this accessible user time and the percent usage. So it all fits together. Yeah. So Jeff, great, great question or a great point. Um, when you apply, your grants have to be active, right? So they can't be expired. So you also have to find people who have active grants uh, beyond uh, beyond that. And then, yes, you can have way more than three major users, if you wish. Let, let me clarify there. It's absolutely the uh, rule that the funding must be current at the time the proposal is submitted. And that's only that's the only requirement as far as the timing. Now, when it gets, if you're fortunate enough to get to the next stage where it's being considered for funding and just in time, the program officer will then evaluate that funding. So if you're unfortunate enough to have half of your users lose their funding, um, you may have the option of adding new users or adjusting percentages. But all it has to be is at the time of submission, 
It has to be active. Um, Sue, and, you know, Faith has a very interesting question there. This is not something we necessarily struggle with here because we don't have so many NIH funded investigators, but medical centers tend to be very different. The question is, it can you have sort of too many major users that they end up sort of uh, not becoming major users anymore. All right. What the way you need to look at this first off is the accessible user time. Some instruments uh, can have a large number of users being accommodated in a realistic amount of time. Uh, you're not supposed to show users less than 1%. And this is something that I think reviewers and program understand as a snapshot of what it's yeah. like, because this the program is only funding for a year for you to purchase the instrument, but obviously it's expected to be used over a large time. So your users may be potential over uh, longer than that year. So you carefully uh, select who gives the best representation of how the instrument will be used. And some of these questions, um, for example, we'll be happy to answer either individually or later if, if you want to yeah. tell us about what you have. And we can say, at least in our experience, whether that seems reasonable or not. I've, I've had the real luck of being able to participate or chair in a large number of review panels and it, it varies widely so yeah. but I'll be happy to help uh, offline anytime you'd like yeah and I just want to add that you you want to pick your major users I mean we often run into you know having many major users um, and we really you know select the best that would be representative of how the instrument will be used and everybody understands that they want to participate to make the grant you know proposal a success so Uma, i'm not sure what nce means no no cost extension oh no cost extension if it's uh, still considered active by your institution yeah. then it is active then it is active yeah yeah and what you'll end up doing is uh when they give you your at some point, uh, you're going to have to actually list out like their their award number. And if you go to the NIH site, if it's it'll tell you if it's still alive or not, even with the no cost extension. And that's the criteria right there. Great question, though. Yeah. Um, so beyond talking, so a lot of it's a lot of talking, which is great for me because that's one of my strong points in, in my life. Um, the next question is, you know, what do the vendors offer? Like you have to know the technologies that are. Uh, out there, right? So you have to know, uh, you know, commercially, what do they sell? How do they contrast from other vendors if there are multiple technologies? You know, like again, a laser scanning confocal is very ubiquitous. There's a lot of vendors out there. You know, why, why this one that you're going for and not somebody else? So you have to understand all of it. And if possible, like, do you do on-site demos to help you collect preliminary data? Is that not possible? Do you have to send samples out or do you have to fly places to get some preliminary data? It's all, uh, you have to think about this stuff and it, it can take time. And also remember, we're all applying for the NIH S10 at the exact same time. So you're competing, if you can do demos, you're competing with everyone else who also wants to do a demo. So starting early goes uh, a long way. And Uma, uh, the, the uh, AUT, we'll get more into that uh, later. Okay, um, uh, I'd like to add a point here. Uh, yeah. it, it is, uh, for example, if there are a number of different instruments that are generally comparable, you have a reason that you're picking the specific one, because as we'll go into, you have to pick a specific model, you have to have a quote, things like that. But it's perfectly okay to say that if the proposal is funded, that you will reevaluate equivalent instruments at the time to make the best choice, because obviously something new can be um, come out in that time. Now, you cannot get more money than you initially asked for, but you could change the the vendor even if there is something uh, that is better at the time. Now, I see a question in the chat about uh, usable hours, and I think I'd like to talk about that at a little later time because it's fairly complex, but I can just say briefly, there's no one size fits all, and it's uh, not the easiest thing to figure out. No, it is a... It's a painful exercise. <laughs> um, yeah, and then uh, Lydia, to, to your question, uh, you'll have to check with your institution. Officially, every university or every institution can apply for as many as they want. 
Um, but as was mentioned earlier, if it if if your institution is going to apply for two of the same thing, you got to make sure there are different users involved. Otherwise, they'll cancel each other out, and uh, you run the risk of the government saying no. So you really want to make sure that your user group is is unique within the institution itself. But there's no limit to the number, except for the big program. There's yes. no limit to the number of proposals that can be submitted from an institution. Right. It's not like NSF. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, as you're preparing, uh, talk to your colleagues who have applied before. You're going to learn a lot um, from them, right? You're going to learn a lot as to you know the whole writing, the preparation. You know, some people are very fortunate and they have staff and they can actually hold themselves away for two months and, and really focus on this. Some people are like me running a very busy solo staffed core uh, and I have to, you know, sequester myself as well as I can and makes everything take longer because I can't ignore the needs of uh, my facility. Right. So ABRF is a great resource for this. You're here, which is fantastic. There's the at the 2023 meeting, there's going to be something. Uh, I know various institutions host these little things, uh, uh, discussion sessions like this all the time. Um, you can look within your specific field. Uh, they may have things like I'm sure Bina for like bioimaging North America has done microscope stuff, as you can see, like it's a microscope in my background. Um, so utilize those resources and learn a, as much as you can. Um, and then does your institution have copies of previous uh, applications? Like you might as well read what others have written, especially successful ones. But you can learn a lot from unsuccessful ones as well if you have reviewer comments and, and things of that nature. And then as you're thinking about this, you really need to consider like, what are you going to need for institutional support? Like, does this instrument require a service contract? How are you going to pay for that service contract up front? The NIH really wants you to show that you're going to support it for years one through five, right? Years one through five are required. After that, it, it's not required. It doesn't hurt, though, to show that you have a plan for years six through 10 and beyond, right? Um, and from a core facility, you say user fees and things of that nature, it's a bit more straightforward. But if it's not in a core, how are you going to maintain the instrument, right? Is a service contract even possible? If not, why isn't it possible? Like, what about it makes it impossible? Um, qualified staff to run the technology, I mean, run the instrument, uh, you know, what expertise are needed? Do you have those on site? And how are they paid for? Again, the university wants to know, or the NIH wants to know, like, if they give you this money to buy something for the next five years, is it really taken care of, right? Um, and then, you know, are renovations needed, right? Do you need to redo part of a room? Like if it's an EM instrument or something like that that requires whatever EM needs or chillers or things of that nature, you know, renovations are not included in the S10 application, but if your institution will pay for that, that's a great demonstration of institutional uh, support. Um, so yeah, so uh, so Jody asked a question, uh, can the cost of the training to use the instrument to be included in the price quote? So I'm assuming you're meaning for yourself. Uh, that uh, Usually that's in, in my quotes, it's included and I have no issues with that, but I don't know if the NIH- I, I, I provided an answer in the oh. chat there. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I didn't yes. Read that. <laughs> that's okay. Yes, uh, training. A, a reasonable amount of training can be included. And for example, in mass spectrometers, at least from Thermo, uh, in general, there's going to be, for example, a three-day on-site training for a modest amount of money. And that's never been a question. And I, I do see a question up further in the chat about uh, the, from Angel Alvarez, if a new piece of equipment will allow us to achieve a higher scale Justification that could, was that reviewed viewed more favorably or new capabilities. Really, it depends on your needs. If you need new capabilities, you'll have to justify that. But if you just need something to uh, help you with capacity issues, that's what you'll justify. So, and but these are the points that we're bringing up today, so you can be thinking about it. What category does your request? Uh, uh, fit into. Um, as far as uh, preliminary data, uh, I don't know, Joe, do you want to cover that in the Q&A session or talk about it now? Yeah, well, let's let's cover that in, in the in the Q&A. Okay. Um, uh, we have one more main slide to get to, then we can go to the, the general Q&A. But before we, we um, go 
to that, I, again, I wanted to illustrate what I applied for was a new laser scanning confocal to replace the old one. I applied for all the same current capabilities uh, or all the same cap capabilities we, we currently have, but just brought into the modern convention. So for example, our resonance scanner was a 512 by 512. The modern ones are 2048 by 2048. So I just asked for the modern version of the same thing. It's the industry standard now of what a laser scanning confocal is. And the reviewers largely accepted all of that, right? So I didn't ask for any extra, true, too many extra bells and whistles, just the modern version of the same thing. As Sue alluded to much earlier, it's sort of easiest to ask for what is already impacting your researchers and to make sure it's going forward, right? So it's the, the low hanging fruit. So um, one more slide here. Okay. Instrument demos. Uh, now, not everybody gets to do an instrument demo. Certain technologies can't be shipped around the, the country, like, you know, mass spectrometers, NMRs, you know, things of this nature. So what you do need to do, though, as, as much as you can is compare multiple technologies or, or multiple instruments. So you need to justify the exact one. So I actually got heavily dinged because uh, within my application, I didn't show a clear table saying why I selected the microscope I did. I just wanted the newer version of that one. I had done demos, you know, they're all largely the same. So I was like, they're largely the same. So I want this one. And the, the review panel did not like that at all. Like, so I got hammered on that. Uh, that's where I lost most of my points. So as I'm preparing for a resubmission, uh, which we're gonna talk about tomorrow, uh, I'm collecting all that data now to show that, you know, all things being equal, I want the one where we're, the continuity of what it is that we know, right? And and that should be okay. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Fingers crossed that that's okay. Um, you know, and you have to consider: Do you have to get on a plane yourself? Do you have to take investigators with you? Like, how do you pay for all that uh, up front so you can travel around if that's what you need to do? Um, and this is where you know, as you build your network of colleagues uh, around the country, you know, can you just ship samples to a friend and have you remote in and pilot from there? And this is another excellent thing about the ABRF because we're all from, you know, as part of the ABRF or from all over the place, you can find people who probably have the technology that you already have, right? Or that you're pursuing, I'm sorry. And you can hopefully lean on them to run a few samples for you, right? This will be incredibly helpful if you can. Uh, as was stated earlier, the preliminary data is not 100, it's not obligatory. It just helps a lot if you have clear preliminary data as to why you need something. So I'd like to add something at this point. Mm -hmm. Do not just show marketing data from the vendor. That is totally useless. And uh, what you need to have are data or results that are pertinent to your users. The very best can if you, and, and mass spectrometers you don't have on site. Uh, and I'm perfectly happy to have samples sent and run by the vendor under their optimal conditions. Best if it's samples from one or more of your users. You don't have to have data from every user. You need a representative for the types of uh, experiments that you're going to do. So, uh, and we can talk more about that later if you'd like. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, it really depends on the technology, the ease of collecting some of the data. And if, you know, I think it helps justify uh, if you do have preliminary data from your major and minor users, what you don't want to do is just put data that was in their, in their funding proposal, right? So you're not just taking a screenshot of what they did, you want modern data, right? Uh, images, figures, you know, but effective ones. And you don't have to do tell the full story. Remember, the federal government's already evaluated their proposal and has agreed to it. They already have the money in their pockets, right? What you're doing is showing that you're gonna allow their research to go further than what they already did, right? So, or what they proposed, right? And, or what they proposed was limited because of the lack of available instrumentation or technology. So you really need to push uh, push that as well as you can, right? And so, again, it depends on the, on the instrumentation type as to how feasible it is to get preliminary data. You can also do things, and I did this as well, um, you know, I said, we really need a water immersion objective. And I didn't have every major user prove they needed a water immersion objective. I did one image showing globally the improvement of this objective, right? And the reviewers didn't flag it. So I'm assuming that means it was a 
a good thing to do. So I think you can be creative uh, in this, you know, in, in various ways to summarize what will impact all your users universally. And we now, see in the chat, uh, yeah. Chad Haney says for in vivo imaging, you might not have a choice. You might have to use examples from the vendor. Of course, it's very specific for each instrument type. Mm -hmm. So thank you for adding that. Yep, very, very good, Chad. Um, so yeah, your data clear and concise. You know, you you don't want reviewers looking at it, guessing what it is. They don't have time. Uh, you'll see in the end, like it's a it's a thick packet of stuff you're writing. The more they're scratching their heads, the more they're just not going to like it, right? You don't want them scratching their heads. You want them reading it through and like getting it right away and moving on. Um, I have a, I imagine the less time they spend on it, the better the score it is you're going to get, and the easier it is to walk away. Um, so you know, clear, you know, conciseness and clarity are essential. Um, and then make sure all the instrument accessories, like all, all these different components of the instrument are gonna be used by, you know, ideally at least at least one user, if not multiple users within your application, right? So you definitely want it to be, um, you, know, you know, very impactful, right? The NIH will actually read through your price quote and all the different features that are there. And if you haven't defended one of them, they're not gonna, they're gonna ding you on it, right? And if you well, ask- no, I, I need to clarify there. The budget is not included in any of the scoring. The mm -hmm. budget is handled after the scores are submitted. But if you ask for a, an accessory that costs above the base cost of the instrument, you have to justify why and who's going to use it. So if you ask for everything available, like on a car, and you've got features of self-driving and you're not going to do it or explain why, you're not going to get it. So, uh, but if you want that accessory, uh, one, it depends how many users. If you've got three users only and one of three, that's fine. If you've got 12 users and it's just one, eh, maybe, maybe not. So, but it's it's a budget uh, situation there. Yeah, and that, Sue, that's a great point. So it's, when, when we're talking about accessories, we're talking about really above and beyond like the basal level of the instrument, right? So any additional, Anything, a great analogy of a car uh, is, you know, all the cool things that you actually want, you have to prove why you want it, not just because they make you look cool. Um, so, yeah, and that can be, that can be very challenging uh, because in your head, you think it's very clear and straightforward. Uh, the reviewers may pose questions in a way you never considered before. Uh, and so you, it's your job to think about all these different facets of, of the questions. Um, and then it's gotta be convincing. Uh, any, if you feel like it's hand wavy, the reviewers are going to know it's hand wavy and not be happy with you. You, you really want to prove it uh, one way or another. Cool. All right. That was a lot of talking, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we are ready. Just, you know, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, any questions that you can uh, right now? There's a long one that just got, came into the chat. Uh, so there's there's one I saw about AUT, and, yep. and we'll cover it again, but I can tell you that it is among the most confusing parts for reviewers um, if it's not explained clearly. And again, as I had alluded to in the beginning, first, it depends on your institution and your access, because uh, some cores or buildings cannot be accessed beyond normal working hours. Some instruments are designed to be used 24-7, uh, and they're what you actually have to calculate. I, I could read out, I won't right now, but for I was fortunate enough to be funded last year in the 40th year of the program again, so it was great. Um, but I had to clearly explain that the instrument can run 24-7, um, but then you have to take away the amount of holiday hours maintenance, uh, QA, QC, and you come up with some number of hours per year that the instrument can be used, then you divide it up among your users based on their pro projected needs. This is totally different for every type of instrument. And this is why it would really be great for you to find someone who has successfully uh, been funded for the type of instrument that you're looking for and see how did they use AUT. 
it just has to be clear and understandable. There's definitely not one way that works for everybody. Yeah, so uh, Ashley had uh, several questions concerning items such as sequencers. Um, Ashley, reading through yours, there uh, a couple of things, the main thing that stuck out to me was faster turnaround time, right? So what the NIH really wants to do is make sure that your research is not being hindered, right? So if your investigator's research is being delayed or negatively impacted because they're waiting for results and this instrument will alleviate that pressure, that's a good strong selling point, right? But you then you have to prove that uh, I'm not overly familiar with sequencer, sequencers and how long they take, but is a two day turnaround time unacceptable and they need a 12 hour turnaround time, for example. Um, is that what they need? Is it, uh, you know, anything that's negatively impacting the research? Now, um, the trade in and things of that nature, like, I don't think they're going to care. Uh, what the cost like what that is uh you're gonna have to figure out how to budget that out yourself right so if you already have an mm -hmm. instrument that can do it and all you're looking at is saving time i don't know but is the new instrument have it more accurate reads is it less prone to error things of that nature i, I think make stronger arguments in, in this regard and i will say that the cost of the instrument is not something that's considered. In fact, in review panels, we often jokingly talk about we can't use the F word of funding. Uh, if the instrument costs a certain price and you justify that instrument, that's all that matters. Uh, if you have a trade-in and that gets an advantage, it I, doesn't really impact the score in any way. It just will show how you get to the cost. Mm -hmm. And then, but the, if but if it's but you know I, I'll just add Ashley that you know if it's impacting your um, <clears throat> capacity, like if you're going to be able to serve the major users, you know more significantly, because for this technology, this is a, a broad use technology, so that is another consideration to think about. Yeah, and again, if you're going to trade in, and you mentioned that the review panel might say like, well. All you're doing is now shifting all the users from that to this new one. So how is this actually going to alleviate the pressure, right? Yeah. Because you're just moving the pressure over. Um, so again, you just have to be very creative and clear with your thought process and let other people punch holes into it that you have to then fill. Your other point or question about you know new companies versus established companies is a good one, right? And the question is, you know, do you need to continue with company X, right? So if you have your instrument from company X and you want the newer version of it for various reasons, the institutional knowledge that you have working with that company and their instrumentation can be a very good argument as to why you stuck with that company. You know, now you may need to see, you know, all the other features that come with it. You, you really have to be thorough with your evaluations. Um, but the point of the company possibly not existing, again, that's not a major issue if you can explain in your current proposal why you're picking the instrument that you're recommending. But as long as there are other companies that make something similar to meet those needs, that won't be a problem. Now, if you're asking for something so unique that no one else makes it and that company might go away, that might be a worry. But if it's if it's a standard type technology and you can justify picking the company that you're requesting, uh, that's fine. Okay. Um, so Jeff uh, asked a question about the internal advisory board, different uh, from different departments to make future decisions and whatnot. Um, if it's different from the external advisory board, uh, you, if you have a steering committee for your core, you can use that largely for the same thing. You just need to make sure that all the boxes are ticked. If you need a university administrator uh, and you normally don't have one on your steering committee, that helps. No, um, you have to. You have to yeah, have one. Yeah, sorry, you have to. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. You also have to have a minor user on there as well, and uh, a non-user, and a non-user exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, make external sure external is not needed. Not external outside of the institution. Mm -hmm. it's an yeah, that's not needed. Right. Um, Great question, though. Um, and it's it's amazing. I made the mistake of not having a minor user, and every one of my reviewers caught that. And so I lost three points 
there. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, and that's 100% my fault. Uh, and away we go. And something to add in that regard that is partly related to the AUT is you do need to allow time for new users and somewhat for method development. So you yep. don't want to account for your user group of 100% of the time. You have to be able to attract new users. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Correct. Uh, and uh, building in, uh, as, as Sue mentioned earlier, times for quality assurance, quality control. Again, it demonstrates that you have a plan of maintaining the instrument as well as understanding how often that instrument can actually be And used. there's no hard and fast rule. Some instruments require much longer regular routine maintenance. And the, mm -hmm. the more you can explain that, the more it's clear to the reviewers that you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Molly asks, like, how often do the guidelines change? F fantastic question. Uh, we're in the middle of a three-year cycle, which is great. It provides some stability. Uh, I don't know, Sue uh, and I Sheena. I will tell you, they uh, essentially have not changed since about my first proposal. So that's a very long time. Uh, but at the ABRF conference this year, in the session on shared instrumentation grant opportunities, there's going to be a breakout afterwards where mm -hmm. the representatives want to hear from applicants and reviewers and administration on what could be changed or improved. There's certain things in the application process that are difficult to obtain, and perhaps the reviewers don't feel it's informative either. So uh, yeah. that will be a marvelous opportunity for you if you can attend the conference to uh, provide your input on uh, what works and what doesn't for your point of view. And just, just to add, the thing that has changed is the reporting. So yes. NIH and ORUP have been, you know, they have to show return on investment. How is this money being spent? And so, you know, the, the, the reporting on how the instrument is used and the em emphasis on the publications I can't emphasize that enough in terms of acknowledging the grant in publications. Um, uh, Chan Hoon uh, brought up the question, like, does the number of major and minor users affect the impact score? Uh, I think you just have to meet the requirements and then as long as it's justifiable. And this is very technology specific, right? If you're going for, again, a standard microscope to really get to a reasonable uh, accessible user time, you may need more users to, in order to conceivably reach that. That being said, if the microscope is for doing continuous five-day studies where it's 24 hours a day, five days a week, or six days a week for these experiments, well, then you only need a handful of users uh, and you're going to actually fill up all the time if that's what the research requires, right? So you need to figure out the right balance uh, in order to show that it's going to be used a lot. And the a lot is in quotes because a lot is a very relative term. For example, several years ago, uh, when I wrote the microscope at the time was being used 4,000 hours a year, and the panel just said, well, there's another 4,000 hours in the year, so this isn't full. Um, whereas all my users are freaking out because they could never get on there at a reasonable time. You know, This year, I came up with a different number that was had more logic behind it with respect to like, what was accessible, and all the panelists said, like, that's great, you know. So it's it's a very challenging question, uh, and it's one that you just, I think they're looking for just good sound logic as to why this is what you're determining as full uh, for your instrumentation, right? And as long as it's very thorough and well thought out, I, I think you'll be okay. You just need to be very logical. Well, a lot of it depends on the type of instrument and whether it is run by core personnel or whether the users operate it because core personnel can uh, very efficiently stack one set to another while uh, scheduling for uh, individual users can be very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, uh, we're happy to help you independently if you would like look at the way that you're describing your user time. And I like to first look at the percentage of use by the major users and then go back to what kind of experiment they're going to do and then figure out what, uh, how to put that into the context of AUT. But remember, the majority of users, uh, of reviewers are also either uh, 
successful applicants or have been involved in the program in some way. So they understand it. And it's very clear when there's not enough use mm -hmm. and when there's, you, you, but of course you don't want to have completely too much either. So. Yeah. And, and Ben, that sort of gets to your question as well. Like, is it better to have like a huge number or a small number? I think you really have to pick what's defensible and for the type of research you're proposing that's going on to the instrument. Um, again, if you have prior history with similar technologies, that's great because you can say like, well, according to our calendar system, they've used it for this many hundreds or thousands of hours on average over the past three years. This will just keep going, right? And that's nice to show your previous history. If it's a brand new instrument, it gets to be a bit more challenging and you just have to design the experiments or design your AUT to fit the experimental need and, and go from there. But if you it's, show that your users generally are there, say eight to six, that's the timing that you say is the accessible time because it really is better when somebody else is there to supervise anyway in case of a problem. Um, so Sheena replied to the next question. Thank you, Sheena, for doing that. Uh, Michael said, if part of the justification for the S10 is future capacity and expanded support, uh, can that be factored into the AUT? Yeah, the, I mean, as long as it's going to be used more or used, you just have to prove it's going to be used a lot. Um, right. Right. Uh, now, I have a comment about the, from Jody saying chair of committee can't be a user. That's not correct. The chair of the committee cannot be the facility director. The facility director will be on the committee and uh, a non voting, but at, uh, <laughs> I can't remember the proper name. It's not ad hoc, but um, ex officio. But uh, the chair of my committee has often been a user. Uh, I've never seen that be a concern. Yeah. Um, so the next uh, two questions concern institutional support, uh, which is always a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so uh, a gap in the scores. Uh, welcome to reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be you're gonna find you're like people give you ones on some things and then the next person be like i didn't like that at all and get you a really horrible score and that's very challenging right um we're going to talk more about scores tomorrow wow. it's very very informative yeah. and very maddening at the same time but uh, you're going to learn a lot more from from sue and sheena tomorrow which is which is absolutely fantastic what i can say very quickly there you have to have true clear documentation from administration that they will be helping to support this instrument if it's possible to have actual dollar numbers in there that's fine but included in that commitment has to be a guarantee that if the core income is not sufficient that there are funds to cover uh, any unexpected expenses Exactly. Operation. So the, the places that I've seen a fabulous proposal just get completely killed is where the core, the institutional support letter was vague and just generally, oh, yes, this is great. We're so happy you're applying. And the more details you can get in there and get commitment from the institution, the better. But we'll talk about more later and then offline if you need help as well. Um. Yeah, so, you know, definitely th th this is where going, we, we have about a, a minute or so left. Uh, so I just want to say, like, this is where if it's part of a core. You get to show that you do cost recovery, you, you do various things and you have finances that you have brought in. And if your core has been around for a while, you can actually show that, you know, you may run a deficit every year and your institution pays for that deficit and that will continue. So showing history will imply and further this going forward and strengthen the letter um, at the same time. Um, so Jody copied in uh, just a little bit more. Yeah. About, um, so I'll let you go for that. No, I was gonna say, you know, we will cover this tomorrow, Jody. I mean, I, I understand that you quoted, you know, from the, um, from the FOA, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's getting, you know, it's an interpretation, right? So we can talk about the advisory committee tomorrow. The most important thing is they want to know that it is being, you know, oversight for the instrument 
and it can be an institutional, you know, a, a, an existing core advisory committee, um, as long as the instrument is being overseen. So they just don't want people to dominate, right? And so that mm -hmm. is the real issue. And Great. The question about the committee, uh, I perhaps haven't thought about it quite like that because I've always been the PI and I'm yeah. the director of the core. So uh, I, it's safest if neither one uh, is, well, certainly you, you don't want that person to be chair. It has to be, and to me, it has to be a user. I don't know how you'd have a chair of someone not knowledgeable with uh, the operations, but we can talk about that more tomorrow. We can talk about it more tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But thank you all for coming. Absolutely. What and a great, we'll continue. great session. So if you can't get enough of this, we'll be here uh, again tomorrow. For those of you uh, of a certain age, that's the same bat time and the same bat channel. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got one person. That's that's all I care about. Um, so hey, I have a but, picture of Adam West on our wall. So <laughs> Exactly. Hey, Adam West, my undergrad had Adam West there for a year, and we still haven't left. <laughs> So, uh, but this also shows, again, like, I know there's gonna be a lot more tomorrow. Come to the ABRF 2023 meeting. Uh, it's gonna be beyond useful for you to keep this discussion going, especially if you're planning for the 2024 application. You know, it's a great, it'll be a great thing. So with that, uh, we will close today's session. Please keep coming back for tomorrow. You have our emails there. Uh, you can email us at any time, and I will forward you back to Sheena and Sue, and we'll <laughs> we'll we'll go from we'll go from there. Hope everyone has a good afternoon or morning wherever it is you are, and uh, talk to you later. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Sue and Sheena, great presentations. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you.